Hello once again to a quick tutorial on uh, one of the labs for the physics course. Um, so a lot of students were requesting to, for some assistance with the Paper River Lab. They were having some troubles with uh, working out some of the details. Um, so I'm posting this video to you know give you guys a little helping hand on a curtain, a couple of things, right? Um, so we'll do a quick run overview of some of the main ideas and uh, you know what you should be getting done. So this lab is basically uh, looking at uh, how vectors work in the real world uh, and how we can compare um, you know, horizontal velocity and vertical velocity and how are they related and how are they not related. So the first part of this was pretty straightforward. You just had to determine um, <clears throat> the speed of your car, so you had to write a procedure. Pretty straightforward, just post that. Um, write a step-by-step -step process, that's the procedure, right? And you were supposed to basically have some idea of your speed of your car before you started into the river. Um, on the actual river, we went out in the hallway, you had, um, you went out in the hallway, we measured a whole bunch of times to travel across the river when it was moving, five trials, well, we took as many trials as you could, um, and then we recorded the data on the data table of your creation, um, create a graph that shows the times you recorded for each trial, right? Well. You know, here's um, some data from one of the groups that had posted their um, <clears throat> work online. And basically to make a graph, you make two columns, right? One with trials versus time. And literally all you got to do is just in Excel you highlight, and go to insert, uh, and then you go to graph and scatter plot. Um, I've been seeing a couple of students for some reason use like weird stuff like these dots and lines and connect the dot things never ever 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 use these things because these data points uh, like these data points here these they're not connected like this these are approximations of the truth and some of them are poor approximations like I can tell that this data point here is probably not uh, accurate like somebody like was missing or wasn't paying attention and that's why this one's way off uh, compared to everything else that's in this zone so never ever connect the dots like that. That's a bad, bad idea. Um, so to make the graph, like I said, go to insert, over to scatter plots, make single point scatter plots, and ta-da, you've got your graph for uh, a lot, you know, non-moving river, non-moving river times, right? Don't forget to format your stuff. Formatting is important. Um, I'm going to expand this thing out because sometimes the chart formats design, right? We want to have uh, axis titles, so this is our uh, time in seconds, and the bottom one is our trials, right? We don't even have to bother with that, right? And this is mostly what you really need. Um, it sometimes helps to have a grid, but for some reason this one doesn't have a very good grid. Ah, this is a good one, right? That's got the the whole thing, and then add the title of the chart, right? Non-moving river times, right? Okay, and there you go. That's uh, one requirement done. In a fraction of time, would have taken you to hand make your graphs, right? <clears throat> okay. So we created the graph. So uh, use the average time to determine the time across the river. We just type in the word average, then hit the equal sign and type in average. <laughs> it doesn't really get too hard. Uh, once you do it a couple of times, it comes pretty easy. You make sure your average is of all the times that you're working on. Close brackets. Ta-da, you've got your average, right? And then you want to make sure that you've got, um, you know, probably two digits since the stopwatch can only get two digits of uh, <coughs> accuracy, right? Um, and then they say find, use standard deviation to determine your margin of error. Um, well, at this point, you know, we've already uh, done standard deviation using uh, the you know the method of you take the difference between each data point, subtract it, then square it, then take the average of all that, and then square root it. Um, but you know, for those of you that want the pro tip here, you type the word standard deviation, right? And then one of the functions of Excel is it actually has 
a built-in standard deviation. Uh, so let's try standard deviation A, right? Estimate statement you should be in a lot of value. Well, let's see if we can find it. What does this one do? Standard deviation by entire population given as arguments, right? So that's the one. Standard deviation population versus standard deviation based on the sample. We're gonna s the difference between population and sample is that if it's a population, you're assuming all the data points of the thing that you're studying. So like, for example, if you're somebody that does statistics on the United States, uh, to do standard deviation on the population of people, you'd have to get data from every single person. But um, most of the time, people that do statistics can't do it for everybody in the population, so they tend to take a sample of a, a smaller group of people. But in this case, since we're using all the data from everything in the pool of the particular situation that we're using that was going on, um, we'll call that our, our population standard deviation. Um, and I don't think we're going to lose too much in terms of the difference between the two. So if it was the population of all the data we just took, right? That one standard deviation is that if it's the sample pot, and I'm just curious just to see what's the difference in terms of uh, magnitude, um, standard deviation of the sample size, if I'm not mistaken, it makes it larger because you're giving less accuracy if something's um, for sample. And when I close, hey, look at that, it's slightly bigger than the standard deviation of our, our population. So truthfully, we don't need the sample one. We can just go with. Um, the standard deviation of the population, and we shrink it all the way down. And so that would give our error to be, um, the error is twice the standard deviation, right? So it equals our standard deviation times two, right? So instead of having to break all those columns uh, and do all that work we've done in the past, uh, congratulations, here's a really quick way to do standard deviation without having to um, make 16 different col you know, all those columns and all that extra stuff going on. <clears throat> it's important that I went over the long way to do it with you guys at first because um, otherwise you're not really understanding what you're doing and it really makes it clearer what the purpose of standard deviation is when you, you, you break it down per data point. So now we know we've basically figured out um, that our average is 0 0.6 and it can swing plus or minus 0 0.27 seconds, right? based on uh, our data we collected. And if that ugly data point was up there, um, wasn't up there, you'd probably have better, a better standard deviation. Okay, check, did all that, uh, found the average, right? You found the margin of error. So in this case, our answer is gonna be 0 0.6 plus or minus 0.27, check, wonderful. Um, oh, determine the speed for the boat across the non-moving river, right? Well, to find speed, right, we know that our speed somewhere. Uh, I'll just keep it right here, right? Speed is equal to our distance divided by our time, right? Um, in this case, uh, the speed was equal to our distance. Our distance was 0.9, well, let's just check. One of our uh, fellow classmates um, posted that the width of the river is 90.5 centimeters. Thank you, Jamel, for your uh, help in finding that number, in case you didn't write it down somewhere. Uh, so 90.5 centimeters is what we're going to use. Right, 90, so point, uh, uh, yeah, so if it's 90, if it, yeah, let's do this straight, right? So our distance is equal to uh, 90 centimeters. Right, that's in cm. Right, and if you don't remember how to convert, remember that there's a hundred centimeters in a meter. So for your meter measurement, because remember we want to keep this all in meters, just to kind of keep the standard that's usually used. Meters is equal to taking the amount in centimeters divided by a hundred. Right, I could have told you that ninety centimeters is 0.9 meters, but you know everyone should know how to do that conversion. That's really important. So in this case, our speed is going to be equal to the distance, which was 0.9 meters, divided by our average time we found, which is 0 0.60 meters, right? That's our speed. And let me make sure we're keeping all these extra decimals again. We only want a couple of digits, right? Um, I'll use three digits for safety's sake. I mean, you probably should only have two, but, um, you know, two 
having an extra digit is usually pretty safe. Uh, you know, you're not going to get penalized on the readings exam for standard uh, for significant digits, but uh, the deal is you don't want to make it like uh, seven digits long when you really only got three digits. So having an extra digit is usually safer than having one less digit where um, you're overestimating your error, right? <clears throat> so we've got our speed, right? Uh, what's the error on that speed? Well, the error on that speed is basically the error of the, it's like if the speed comes from the average, right? Well, the error in the speed comes from the error in the time. So basically you could think of it like that the error is, error, <laughs> is going to be equal to the distance, which was um, 0.9 plus uh, divided by the maximum time, right, which we could say was uh, da, 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 da. the true time plus the um, error, right, that would be like the maximum we could get in terms of our speed. So that would give us up to, so, so our max speed could be up to 1.7 and our minimum speed would be equal to taking the not the, not the not centimeters, the distance divided by the time. But instead of having the largest time, we want our smallest time. So that would be that average time minus our error, right? So basically, we we're saying, right, that based according to our average, paste, where's the paste? Right, according to our average, our stopwatch is telling us it's 1.5 meters per second is the speed of the car. But because of the error in using the stopwatch, it could be up to like 1.7 meters per second, or it could be like down to 1.2 meters per second. That gives us our plus or minus. Right? And so that's how you should state your final answer in terms of the maximum speed you could have according to error and the minimum speed you could have uh, according to error. Right? Okay, great, wonderful. So we found our margin of error, right? That's for time. And we also found the margin of error for uh, the meters per second. I mean, if you want the, like, the technical margin of error, the technical margin of error is just going to be the difference between uh, our maximum value minus the average value. Right? So that's our margin plus or minus meters per second, right? That's the, the plus or minus meters per second we're talking about. It could be plus or minus 0.27 meters per second, right? Okay, great. So now we got all that taken care of. Non-moving river, done, check. Prediction, do you think it'll take more or less time for the car to try the moon? Yeah, so this is just whatever you thought before you went out to the hallway. Hopefully you don't look at your data before you make the prediction. That's kind of cheating. Um, just, you know, hopefully you, you did what you're supposed to do. Uh, moving River, doing exactly the same thing all over again. Um, I'm going to kind of just give us an extra space here, insert this, shove this over a little bit, and bring that down. I'm just going to kind of move it so that we're not overrunning other things. Right, Moving River. Um, and then same thing, right? Where you can literally just, I'll take that, drag it over there. Right, took the function. I can even repeat average over and over and over. Average, average, average. Well, we don't need all that. We just need, uh, no. <laughs> we just need the average and the average. Uh, and our standard deviation, we can even do the same thing again. See, like the beauty of Excel is once you've done it once, the rest of it, it just kind of locks in. It'll follow the same process over and over and over again as long as you've uh, worked it out properly. And the great thing is the results here are, are fantastic for whoever took this data. Um, the average time they found was 0.6 seconds for the non-moving river. And for the moving river, they found the average time to be 0.58. Considering that the error is plus or minus, uh, you know, 0.1 seconds, they're both right within the margin of error. It's pretty clear that the non-moving river and the moving river, in this case, they both have the same cross time. Even though the river made the car go faster, the time to cross the river was the same. 
Okay. Standard deviation, standard deviation over and over and over again. Get rid of the two we don't need. Um, check, check. What else do we need? Uh, determine a way to find total distance a car travel across the river. Okay, so here's where it gets a little dicey. So here was straight nice and easy, right? The car, um, where's my, there it goes, right? So the, the original situation, right, for the non-moving river, right? The distance across was pretty, why did you just turn yellow for me? Turn yellow, it's red. <laughs> okay, so you got your river here, right? The original one, it was pretty easy. The car, again, <laughs> the car, um, the car went across straight and easy, right? That was just the the with the non-moving river, right? I should probably write that out. Non-moving, right? <clears throat> but in the case of where we have the uh, moving river got a different situation going on here uh, basically okay, okay, you're done. basically in the moving river yeah, I'm like this if the river is f flowing um, upwards like this right The car, when it tries to cross, I'll use this similar, use a different color, right? So when the car tries to cross, instead of going directly across, the river is going to drag up the pathway of the car. And so the car lands at some height up from the riverbank instead of, you know, straight across. So what that means is, is that your, um, what you've got here is you now have not just the distance across the river, you also have to take into account the vert... It's changing colors on me again. You also have to take into account the vertical distance. So I'm going to show, try to show you this in stages, right? So there's the horizontal distance that the car traveled, right? It, it did travel a horizontal distance. And then on top of it, there's the vertical distance that the car traveled up the riverbank. Because the truth is that the car, I'm making like a thousand dots for no reason. Get rid of those dots. The truth is the car, right, it didn't go just horizontally and just vertically. It went a combination of both, that this full displacement was a combination of um, what we call a a combination of what we would call a displacement horizontally, a horizontal displacement, and a displacement um, vertically, right? A vertical displacement. It's a combination of both. That our display, our full displacement is a combination of the horizontal displacement and the vertical displacement. So how do we combine these two things to determine the full displacement of the boat, the river, which is what it asks. It's asking Let's read it again, right? Um, determine a way to find the total distance the car traveled across the river. That is what this thing is, right? That's the that's the total distance, right? Well, if you've been a student of geometry, you'll notice that this shape is a right triangle, right? And if you want to find um, the three sides of a right triangle, if you know two sides, right? Uh, it's uh, it's the old school Greek Pythagorean theorem that you say a squared plus b squared is going to be equal to c squared, right? But in this case, instead of using a squared, b squared, and c squared, we can use uh, dx squared plus dy squared is equal to d squared, because that's our full, that's the third leg of the triangle, right? So, right, uh, to calculate it, right, we would just plug in our numbers into dx and dy and determine the, the full distance. Now, the dx is pretty easy, right, because the dx is just literally how far it is across the river. That's uh, 90 from Jamel's, right, 90.5, right? That's from Jamel's, uh, you know, measurement. The dy, that one's a little trickier, 
right? So you, we didn't really sit there and measure how far the car drifted after every single turn. So we can't really use that as a way of determining the, the distance. But what we did measure was we measured our, our vertical velocity, right? When the car was going, right, the last part of the out in the hallway, we kind of like put the, the, the cars were like sitting like here and then it drifted up the up the river and then stopped there and we timed it we had a little meter stick sitting right you know our brown meter stick was sitting right next to it by timing the time it took for the cars to travel a meter we basically got enough information to determine our velocity so velocity is equal to our velocity was equal to um, distance in the y divided by time, right? And here was our dy, and there was our time. Um, we measured it at that particular time, and we measured that particular time, right? So this here, this information will feed your, your, your velocity in the y. This was the dy. I'm going to make this slightly different. dy um, for the river speed, right? When we had the meter stick, we measured the speed of the river using this equation. Now, to find the distance that the car traveled when we shot it across the river while the river was moving, if you measured the time, we measured the time, right? Over back here, we measured the average time it took the car to cross the river, right? And then, so we know, we know, so I'm going to rewrite it down here, right? So for the dy, so if we're trying to find the dy for the car crossing, right? So if we're trying to find the, the, the vertical displacement when the car crossed, basically we need the time, right? The time, what did that equal to when the car crossed? We would need uh, the velocity. And what would the velocity equal to when the car crossed? And then that would give us our D, uh, we could solve for dy because we can say um, that rushing, right? We can say that instead of saying that velocity is equal to distance over time, if I want the distance, I can multiply both sides by the time. And so, and I'm just going to put the subscripts in afterwards. The velocity in the y direction times the time that we measured for it to cross the river will give us the distance that it drifted in the y direction. So once you plug in the velocity from, of the river times the time it took to cross the river, that'll give you your vertical displacement, which you can then plug into this equation, and then, you know, that squared plus that squared would go that squared, and ta-da, we've figured out the total distance the car travels. So all of that I just said, you've got to basically express that in words if you're really answering that question. Um, figured that out, right? Using your time data and the distance across the river to determine the speed for the boat across the moving river. Well, basically, it's the same thing, right? Uh, instead of the dx and the dy, we could think of it as the uh, vx <laughs> squared plus the vy squared is going to give us our full v, right? The vx you determined, right? here, right, that was the Vx, and the Vy you can determine from the one meter slide, right, so if I take the average of that, those data values, let's make some space, and then uh, say that the velocity is equal to the distance, which was uh, one meter, because <laughs> that's how far it slid, one meter divided by the time, which was 8.4 seconds. You know, you could find the velocity of the river. This would be your V Y, because that's the velocity, that's the river speed, right? 
So you got your VY from from measuring that how fast that car slid down the river. You found your where is this thing? This is the VX down here, right? That's our VX. So if we've, you've got your VX and you've got your VY, you just you just plug it into where'd it go? Arr, wrong one. I'll find you. There it is, right? You just plug it into um, you plug it into VX squared plus VI squared. Uh, Vy squared, and there you go. You'll have your velocity crossing the river. Okay, anything else? We've got plot your results. Great. Oh, plot your results. Right. So you go back to if you want to plot. It says plot your results for the moving river on the same graph as the non-moving river, but with a different symbol for the data point. Um, there's a couple of ways to do this. You could just, you know, highlight all that data and do it. Um, another way to do it is if you click on um, the graph there's an option to select the data right so right now the only data that you've got is um, you've got the horizontal categories which are giving you one two three that's the trials but I could add another one right which is gonna be our X values are the trials right and this is for uh, the moving And then the y values are the times we used for the moving river. So this is a way of manually entering data into a graph without selecting. Sometimes when you try to just select everything on a chart, it's going to give you problems. So by going into, and I'll show you again how to do it because you, you might have missed it. So you could rewind, but let's change that to, uh, I don't want, I want to name it the non Moving river, right. not moving, moving river. Okay. All right. So what I did was I right-clicked on the chart. I went down to select data, and then you can add as many data sets as you want onto a chart using the select data. You pick the same horizontal category for all of them, and then the it'll just pop in the way you want it. And in the key, you'll have a very clear what each dot represents. Right? So selecting data, a very powerful tool when you're trying to edit your, um, your graphs. And it's a way of like, let's say you had lots and lots of data that you wanted to, uh, like let's say you had different sets of data and you wanted to be on different graphs. Instead of reformatting the same chart over and over again, you could like basically copy the chart. Like um, uh, you could copy the chart, copy, and then have a second chart and then pick a whole different set of data and you'll still have your axis titles all preset up for you. So if you had like tons of data to use in college, by just picking different data, you don't have to do the rework of retyping the whole, uh, this is, I learned this lesson the hard way. Because I used to like, when I had to do these, I would like type all these things over and over and over again. Well, you got to do is just once, make the graph once, copy it, paste it, and then change the data source, whatever data you're picking, and then you can display uh, the same data on, uh, you know, different data on a, on the same looking chart. Helpful, helpful tip. Okay, let's get rid of that. Getting towards the end now. Getting towards the end. Um, ba -ba -ba -bum. We plotted the same thing. Time data and the distance of the river determine the speed of the boat across a moving river. Check. So, did, so in this particular case, right? I'll even just use Excel for our full speed. Right, it's going to be equal to the square root. Right, remember. Well, let's go back to so everyone's on the same page. I could think of it as um, if I want to find v. Oh, that's v squared. <laughs> if I want to get rid of that square, I could square root the vx and the vy on both sides, and then so my v is equal to the square root of vx squared plus vy squared. And I can put this equation right into Excel, right? That's going to be equal, no, equal to SQRT, right? That's square root. And then it's the square root of V. Where's our V? Right? That's the VX, right? VX raised to the second power plus VY raised to the second power. And then I put in and close brackets, right? And there we are. That's it. That's our full speed. 
uh, the full speed of the car is 1.51 meters per second, right? Well, it's not much significantly different than what this one is. I think it's actually right in the same, yeah. But, oh, it's a whole 0 0.004 meters per second faster. Uh, it's not going to be a significant difference because, you know, look, at, at the speed of the river was very slow for this particular data set. They were going very slow, which is okay, right? But if you look at a couple of digits in, you can see there is a slight difference that the full speed of the river is better than um, the uh, full speed of the river was higher than just the speed horizontally, although most of the speed came from the, the, the engine of the car. Okay, so we got the full speed. Create a method to determine the speed of the river. Well, we did that with the whole car sitting on the table with the meter stick, check, done, collect necessary data, did all that, right? Okay, now we get to the point where everybody was like, oh, I need number seven, help me, help me, okay. Um, so, data and observation. Does the boat only move in the directions pointing throughout the experiment? Explain your answer. I mean, look, the boat is pointed uh, this way. <laughs> the boat's pointed this way during the whole experiment, like across the river, but in reality the boat goes that way, so no, it doesn't go, right? Um, analyze and evaluate the trends in the data. Look at the two data sets, you know, you may have different results than this. This particular case, my analysis would be something like, oh look, they're, they're slightly different from each other, but because the margin of error is, you know, large enough, um, there is a significant difference between the two. That I mean, there's no significant difference. I can't basic. There's no statistical way to see a difference between the moving and the non-moving river time. Um, Jack, wonderful. Show your final result for the speed of the river, including the margin of error. Oh yeah. So we've got the full speed, um, and then our margin of error. Uh, that gets a little dicey. What you would do is you would take the maximum of the margin of error for this and then add the maximum pl squared plus the maximum with the margin of error for that squared. Uh, let's just do it. Okay, I'll show you how to do it. Right. So if I'm trying to find the margin of error for the full speed, right? so uh, you got to think of it as though um, you're looking at, you want to see the one way, well, this is one way, there's more than one way to do this, there's like a whole rule set to find margin of error, but in this case I can go back to this equation and plug in the maximum velocities for both of them and see what comes out, and then I can plug in the minimum velocities for both of them, and then see what comes out, right, so uh, going back, right, so our, our full speed was that, so the max it could be, and then the minimum it could be Okay, did we do standard deviation for this? Yes, we did. Yes, we did. Uh, drag that over, All right? Uh, let's move this whole thing down a little bit so we can fill in some missing information. Um, this is somewhere it's not gonna. There, we're gonna put our vx and our vy. Let's put vx and vy in the same place. Insert cut cells. Right, so that's our VX, that's our VY right there, right? The standard deviation for the uh, VY was that, so our error was equal to the standard deviation times uh, 2, right, because we're twice, right? So the error is plus or minus 2.12 seconds, right? So that means that the VY has a maximum value and a minimum value. So the maximum of the VY would be um, equal to the distance across the river, no, the distance traveled, which was one meter, right, divided by um, the maximum time in the Y, which would be Ah, yes. That the average time traveled plus the error, right? So that would be the max. No, this is the minimum. I have a reverse. That's the minimum speed. That's the maximum speed, right? 
and then our maximum uh, speed would be equal to the distance across one divided by um, our average time divided by uh, plus minus our error which is equal to minus 2.07 something something's weird here something is weird here let's figure it out where are we getting this number from I took 1 divided by the time right check that makes sense so why is our minimum speed so much faster than the VY? What am I? I missed something here, didn't I? I bet I did. Something's not. Oh, I think I know. I think there it is. Right. <laughs> this is the last part of the problem-solving method where you do a check. Right. So I'm looking at my numbers here, and I see that my VY was 0.12, but then I'm seeing my maximums like two meters per second faster. That, that's something wrong. So by going trailing back through what I was doing, I see that my standard deviation was counting these random zeros in there too, like they were part of it. So if I pull this up a little bit, it should give me some adjustment, I'm hoping. No, it doesn't change at all. What is going on here? Why? Why is my standard deviation so large? So large. this thing wrong? Why did I calculate that wrong? I took 8. Oh, I know what I did wrong. I forgot order of operations. You gotta put these things in parentheses, right? Because it's gotta, what it was doing was taking 1 divided by 0.17, then it was adding. Right? Something silly. That's kinda, you just gotta make sure that you your computer's stupid, basically. Because watch, when I do this, now we're in the right battlefield. It should be 0.09 and then this one again I forgot the parentheses <sighs> okay. so if I said my velocity in the y was you know 0 0.12 then the ma minimum it could be would be 0 0.09 and the maximum could it could have been was that and the margin Our margin of error was plus or minus 0.09. Is that right? The margin is going to be equal to not B33, B31. There we are. All right. So our margin of error is um, yeah, plus or minus 0.02. <laughs> Sorry kids, this is a very, very long video and I'm trying to make sure I'm not losing the, the thread. Just give me two seconds. So the margin of error is the difference between the maximum and the average, right? So I have them backwards. Let's just do it manually. The margin of error is the difference between the maximum value minus the average value. Right? So there we are. That's our uh, margin of error. So our margin of error for the y direction was plus or minus 0.04, and the margin for the x direction was 0.27. Right. Okay, wonderful. Too much, but it is what it is. Okay, last but not least, now that I've got my margins, my maximum and minimum values for the x and the y, right? Let's put these together so they make sense that they're what how they're all kind of organized. Um, now I've got to find the margin of error for the full speed. So the way I calculated the full speed was I took the x value squared plus the y value squared and then square rooted it, right? Well, I'm going to do the same thing again, right? Except this time, this time, copy, paste. 
This time, I'm not going to take the average. I'm going to take the maximum value of the x. There we go. I'm going to take the, um, not the average value. I'm going to take the maximum value in the x. And instead of the average value in the y, I'm going to take the maximum value of the y. Enter. Right, great. So that my maximum full speed could be 1.78. And my minimum speed, same thing again. Copy, paste. My minimum speed is the smallest velocity in the x and the smallest velocity in the y squared, square rooted, right? And there we go. And then our margin is going to be equal to taking the maximum value minus what we actually found. Our margin of error is plus or minus 0.26. Uh, is plus or minus plus or minus 0.26 meters per second. Right. By the way. Um, you know, when you're do, watching videos like this, I, I know it's exceptionally long, and at some points, some of this was uh, <laughs> took a little while to sort through. But this is the kind of process you want to do when you're doing a lab. It, it really shouldn't be smooth sailing. But at the end, when all said and done, you should uh, have answers that make sense, right? That um, you know, I figured out a way to calculate the full speed from taking the vx squared plus the vi vi. vi ugh vy squared <laughs> and square rooting it and then to find the maximum value I took the maximum x squared plus the maximum y squared and square rooted it and then to find the minimum I took the minimum x squared plus the minimum y squared and then square rooted it as long as you label everything and make sure that you don't just put like random numbers in random places on the spreadsheet um, you'll, you'll come to your answer, but you just got to be very careful that you, what you're doing and make sure everything lines up and makes sense by the end. And if you notice weird things like crazy numbers coming out and if they, you know, do they work or not, think about it for a second and you'll probably come to where uh, your answer should be. Okay. <sighs> that was a lot. So now we've been able, let's just uh, read in. Here, show your final results for the speed of the river, including the margin of error. Check, check, and check, right? Use your results for the speed of the boat and the speed of the river. Calculate the speed of the boat com speed of the boat compared to the ground when the boat is headed directly downstream and directly upstream. Oh, okay, pretty straightforward. Um, uh, if this speed Vx, right, was pointed up the river, right, you'd be adding the speed of the river, right? Like, uh, so maybe a picture makes a sense. Uh, this, um, if the boat, right? So let's see if we can find some clean space to work. I can put it over here, right? So, so let's say uh, a brush, a car, right? Car is going like this, right? If the car is going this way, and the river is also going this way, then we would just add. We would add um, the speed of the car. Let's say the v, what was v x is like v y one, right? And then the river. That would be like vy2. So in the case of the data here, right, the v, the speed of the car was 1.5, right? So wait, that little thing again. Let's move this thing over so I can see both things. The same. There we are, right? The speed of the car was 1.5. The speed of the river, where's our speed of our river? The vy that was 0.2. One two meters per second. With the terrible mouse handwriting. You add them together, right? One point five plus one point two. That's going to be uh, one point six two meters per second. That's if the car is going with the river. Now, if it was reversed, if the car is going like this and the river is going like that. And you just add, you subtract it, right? You would do the they would the river would be robbing the car of speed. So instead of adding the two speeds, you would subtract. So that would be um, 
1.5 minus 0.12, which is going to give you 1.38 for this particular case, meters per second. As you can tell, <laughs> I'm getting a little tired. Um, if you can read it, it, you know, use my words, right? Uh, it would cancel each other out when they're opposite, and they would add together when they're going together, right? So, uh, da, 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 check. Calculate speed of the boat compared to the ground when the boat's heading. Uh, yeah, that's it. So this is exactly it. It's just basically they add or they subtract. If they're with each other, they add. If they're against each other, they subtract. The last thing. Oh, so close. Do small propeller aircraft always move in the direction they're pointed? No, they don't. Because the wind blows, and if the wind is blowing, it's either going to speed up the airplane or slow down the airplane or shift it to the left or shift it to the right because airplanes float on air. Boats float on water, and in the case of our uh, cars, they were floating on top of that paper, right? When the paper moves, if the car is on top of the paper, the car is going to move not in the direction it's planning on going. And that will be the same thing for an airplane. The airplane doesn't, you know, have some magical can go straight even when the rest of it is going um, the wrong way. And how might an airplane be a bike a boat in this experiment? Exactly what I just said, right? An airplane is a boat. It's floating on a fluid, except it's not water. The fluid is air, right? And so it, it acts exactly the same way as the boat would act in this paper river. Um, I hope that was beneficial, that was long, and I know there's some confusion at some points in there, but, um, you know, I think at the end we got our main results. My recommendation to anyone listening to this, I would definitely break this into pieces and not try to listen to the whole thing in one shot. Um, you know, fast forward and rewind to the spots that are most important to you. And, uh, you know, any questions, Always my email is always open. Uh, best of luck, and... Uh, Look forward to seeing all the good work. Thanks a lot. Bye.